Welcome everyone to the March 23rd, 2024 meeting of the Humanist Society of Santa Barbara. My name is Judy Flattery. I'm the president of the society. Mm -hmm. To let you know a little bit about us, we're a 501c3 nonprofit. We're 100% volunteer run, founded in the mid 90s with about 113, 115 dues paying members at this time. We welcome new members interested in finding out more about humanism and those interested in contributing their talents to our organization. We run these monthly educational speaker meetings on Zoom. Sometimes we have hybrid meetings like we did this past Thursday. Then the talks are edited and shared on our YouTube channel. Our public events are posted on our meetup site. We also have in-person social events and excursions like we had one to JPL and Caltech a month or two ago. And these events are also published in our monthly newsletter called The Secular Circular, which is available for free to anyone who's interested in getting an email copy. Or if you're a member, we'll send you a hard copy if you need a hard copy by request. Dues and donations, we welcome checks. We also have a PayPal account. And the QR code for our PayPal account is there at the bottom of the page. Today, we're very happy to welcome Dr. Marsha Hofer as our speaker, talking about will California's end of life law help you if you need it? Our speaker is a PhD, a retired clinical psychologist, a former professional dancer and an avid gardener and traveler. In 2021, she and her family accompanied her husband, Ricardo, to the Pegasus Clinic in Switzerland where he was able to have a peaceful and painless death. Diagnosed with dementia, Ricardo wished to end his life at home, but did not qualify for California's End of Life Option Act. After returning to California, Marsha began to think about the many people who are denied the right to make their own end of life decisions due to the restrictions in the current law. This concern led her to create this organization, A Better Exit. We're very happy to have you here, Marsha, and I turn it over to you. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Judy. It's great to be here. That's my husband, Ricardo Hoffer. Meet Ricardo. That was taken in Yosemite a few years before he died. Let me tell you a little bit about him. He was a clinical psychologist as well, an amateur musician, a voracious reader, and a guy who really liked to figure things out for himself and be in control. Many, many years ago, uh, we had a house with a porch that ran around the front of it, and that porch roof needed to be re-roofed. And I discovered my husband on the roof with a hammer in one hand and the how-to book in the other hand. So you can see where I'm coming from here. This was a guy who liked to figure things out and get things done his own way. So as Judy said, he had actually, he had told me many years before he had any symptoms that he, if he ever developed dementia, he would not want to let that disease run its course. His own mother had dementia and died institutionalized, very regressed without any language. It was a pretty terrible situation for a number of years. And he began to have symptoms very s slowly over a period of years, starting in his 60s. Most people didn't notice anything. Our children noticed and I noticed and he noticed. And finally, he was having enough difficulties and actually had a diagnosis of early dementia and he really wanted to do something about it so the family started talking this was at the height of covid we had one daughter in portland and one daughter in la and we we're in the bay area so every couple of weeks we would have a family meeting we called them unhappy hours so everybody would be in their own house with their own glass of wine and we would start talking about how to figure this out. We realized that the law here in California would not help us. So we started researching what was available. That was a long process. 
in many ways, it was a good process because the family was very united. There wasn't any difference of opinion between any of the six of us, my husband, myself, my two daughters and their partners. And we finally decided that Switzerland was our best option because it was legal, it was painless, it was quick. And we did know certainly that people try various methods at home. Sometimes they work, sometimes they don't work. We spoke to a friend who's a physician who really advised against trying to do this at home because her advice was a failed attempt could be a lot worse than no attempt at all. So we went to Switzerland and my husband died at the Pegasus Clinic with his family right there with him. He went out listening to a Bach cello suite, which was his favorite music. And it was the most peaceful death I can imagine. So I came back from Switzerland, as Judy said, and began to think about how crazy it is that a person from California should have to fly across an ocean to receive this help when it's something that I thought we should really have the right to have here at home. So that's what I started thinking about. I uh, managed to meet a few other like-minded people and together we started this little grassroots organization, which we came to name A Better Exit. Our first task was to figure out what we wanted to do to try to change the law. It's a difficult process and we've come to learn quite a bit about the legislative process in California, more than I ever thought I wanted to know about it, to tell you the truth. But let's back up a little bit. So the history of the right to die movement in the US is interesting. I was surprised to learn that someone tried to pass a bill in the Midwest in 1906, and there were various efforts over the years, none of which succeeded until Oregon passed their death with dignity law in 1994. It was not implemented until 1997. But so that was the first uh, right to die law in the U.S. 1997. A few years later, the state of Washington passed a law based on the Oregon law, basically the same law, and California was the next. You may remember the name of Brittany Maynard. She was a young woman with brain cancer who lived in California and wanted to end her life before the disease ended it. Uh, but she couldn't do it in California. So she and her husband moved to Oregon so that she could use the law there. But she became an advocate and she was young and she was telegenic and very articulate. And it, largely due to her efforts the medical establishment in California dropped its opposition. And so our end of life option act was passed in 2015 and went into effect in 2016. Now, since then, other states have followed suit. So at this point, there are 10 states that have a law and the District of Columbia is an 11th jurisdiction. All of those jurisdictions basically have the same law that was passed in Oregon with very, very minor differences. So undoubtedly, you all knew that there was a law in California because it's the title of this talk, but you probably knew anyway. We find that most people do know. But what we find is that many, many people don't know who is included and who is excluded because people don't generally have a need to read the fine print of the law until they think they would like to use it or they know somebody who would like to use it. So the law in California, which is the original Oregon model, requires that you be within six months of death. That is the only way you can access the law. So who is able to use the law? By and large, it's people with cancer. Those are the situations in which a doctor can, with not great success, but pretty good accuracy, uh, make a guess about prognosis. But 
there are huge numbers of people who are left out. Certainly anyone with dementia can't access the law by the time a person with a dementia diagnosis is anywhere close to six months, they're not making any rational decisions, let alone being able to express the wish to die. They may have that wish, but they probably can't express it. There are other people with neurological conditions that have a lot of trouble with the current law. One of the reasons has to do with the way the lethal medications need to be taken under the law. The law says that the medications have to be self-ingested. Ingested and ingestion has been interpreted to mean the gastrointestinal tract. So that means that a person has to be able to hold a cup, lift a cup, drink about two ounces of a very thick concoction because it's a combination of I think it's five drugs at this point that they're using that have to be dissolved in some kind of a liquid, liquid so it's fairly thick. Many people can't do that at the point when they're, even people with cancer, they're too weak. Some people can't swallow. Some people's GI system is too affected by their disease so that they they either can't swallow or can't absorb the medication. The only other ways it can be introduced is using a rectal catheter, but even then a person would have to have the strength to push a plunger. Or if somebody already has a feeding tube, it can be introduced that way. But this is very limiting because take, for example, a person with a condition like ALS. By the time they are at six months to death, they may have lost so much strength and agility in their hands that they really can't self-administer the medication. So a better exit came up with what our asks would be. So this is our mission statement. Because what we want to do is redefine the criterion for accessing the law so that we get away from the idea of a timeline, a certain requirement that you have to be within a certain uh, number of months of death and say that if you're struggling with something that in your judgment you can't tolerate, you should have the right to access this law. So there's our website, there is our contact email, and Dave, if you could put up the next slide, it'll show what our three requests, here we go. So this is what we decided we should ask for. Remove that six month criterion and replace it with broader language. Allow an injectable, and in other words, an IV option, which would still be self-administered. This is how Ricardo died in Switzerland, by the way. A medical person put an IV into his wrist and when he was ready, he moved a little dial which released the lethal medication into his vein and um, I think he was probably dead in under two minutes uh, with no discomfort whatsoever. And the third request, which is very important to us, is to allow those with early to mid-stage dementia to access the law. They would need to still have um, decision-making capacity, but... People in the early to mid stage of dementia have the legal right to make all kinds of decisions for themselves, including medical care, legal decisions. So our feeling is that this really should be no different. So what happened next was we had to figure out how are we going to achieve this? There really only are th three routes that you can use to change a law or get a new law passed. One would be the ballot initiative process in California, which is hugely expensive. The second would be a court challenge, which also would be very expensive because you would need a lot of legal work. And the third is the legislative process. And we decided to go the legislative route. So over a period of I would say a year and a half to two years, 
we met with as many legislative staffers as we could, explaining them what to them what we were asking for and why, what we think the problems are with the current law, and asking them if their legislator, we were meet, meeting both with you know people in, in the assembly and in the state senate, would consider authoring a bill. A legislator in California has a limit of 50 bills that they can author in any two-year session. I don't know what the number is, but I know that each of them gets hundreds and hundreds of requests from constituents. Please pass a bill about this. Please change that bill, you know, this kind of thing. And what happens is that during the fall, they get these requests and they start reading through them and considering them and deciding what bills they will author. In January, they have to make a decision if they haven't already because bills need to be filed in February. We thought it would be a heavy lift to find someone to do this because what we're suggesting is a big departure from any of the laws in the US. It's much more progressive than any legislation that has been passed in the US. There has been legislation similar proposed, but it has never been successful. So uh, somewhat to our surprise, I have to say, in January, we found out that we have an author, and that's Senator Catherine Blakespear. She is in Southern California. It's Senate District 38, which covers parts of San Diego County and parts of Orange County. So we were thrilled to have an author. And what happened then was working on the language. This is a very big project. We had a hand in it. The senator's legislative director has been working very hard on it. And the language of the bill was just finally published a couple of days ago. The deadline for actually filing a bill was the middle of February, and they did that. They filed what's called a spot bill. It's a placeholder without the full language in it. I was also told that from the date that a bill is filed, nothing can happen for 30 days. And I asked someone, one of the people that's advising us, what's that 30-day hold period about? And he said, well, you might not believe this, but it's a holdover from the horse and buggy days when it took a long time to circulate information. But that 30 days is now up. The uh, full language of the bill was published. And what will happen next is that in a couple of weeks, the bill will go to the health, the Senate Health Committee. It will either be passed in that committee or those senators might say, well, we'll pass it, but only if you make ABC changes to it. If that happens, the senator staff would come back to us and say, well, do you want to let it move forward with these changes or do you want to let it die and resubmit it in the next session? This is a big, ambitious bill and it'll probably be quite controversial. So it may well need to be resubmitted a few times, it may need to be resubmitted many times, but we're in here for the long haul. And fortunately, Senator Blakespear is early in her career. She was elected in 2022, and assuming that she holds her seat, she has another 10 years because legislators in California have 12 years before they're termed out. And she's committed to seeing this through. So that, that's really the good news for us. We expect a lot of opposition. And it will come mainly from two sources. One is the Roman Catholic Church, which has opposed end-of-life legislation any time it has been proposed. The other um, source of opposition will be some very loud voices in the disability community. Again, there are groups that have opposed all end-of-life opposition. In fact, some of those groups are suing the state of California right now because they believe that no one should have the right to make this choice. 
A couple of years ago, the End of Life Option Act was modified by a bill that was called SB 380, which reduced the required time between two oral requests for the medication from 15 days to 48 hours. This was an important improvement because there were people that were approved for the medication, but because they had to wait 15 days to make their second oral request, some people were dying in during that 15-day period before they could actually get the medication. So SB 380 modified that to 48 hours. It sounds like a, a fairly minimal tweak, but these groups decided to sue after that was done. I've read the brief and the, the state of California responded that these people don't have standing and that the suit should be thrown out. I think they're correct because I, my under, although I didn't go to law school, I forgot to go to law school and went to psychology school instead. But I think really you're supposed to be able to show some injury in order to have standing to sue, which they have not shown. But it, Certainly these groups will come out swinging against us and we're prepared for that. So in fact, there's another lawsuit that's worth mentioning that has to do with the issue of self-administration. This, this was a lawsuit that was introduced a couple of years ago by a woman who had ALS and she sued the state of California saying that the law was not in compliance with the ADA, the Americans with Disabilities Act. What she was requesting was that she be allowed to have somebody help her if she could start to lift the cup. She wanted someone to be able to help her guide it to her mouth because she was losing function rapidly. She qualified for the law, but she said, I have kids. I don't, I want to use the law, but I don't want to die yet. But if I wait any longer, I will lose the ability to self-administer the medication. Seems like a reasonable argument. Well, the judge ruled against her saying that to allow that assistance, it would be rewriting the California law. So she did die before she actually would have liked to because she wanted to use the law. So uh, that's a very interesting case because, of course, the ADA is designed to, to uh, provide whatever assistance that people with disabilities have. So I, I believe that case is being reintroduced with another plaintiff, but we'll see what happens. So we don't really know what will happen going forward. We certainly hope that at least a piece of this legislation will pass this time around, but we're not sure. By the way, our three requests are in the bill. If you go to our website, which actually I hope you will go to our website and join on as a supporter, it would be wonderful. We're trying to increase our numbers. But uh, on our website, there is a link to the senator's fact sheet, which uh, details how she sees the problems with the bill and what is in the bill. Um, in addition to the three requests that a better exit made, she added a couple of things. One is removing the residency requirement in California. At this point, you have to be a resident of California in order to access to the law. A couple of years ago, Oregon dropped their residency requirement, and it happened in an interesting way. There was a physician whose practice was in northern Oregon, so he was fairly close to the Washington state border, and he had patients that lived in Washington state and patients that lived in Oregon. One of his patients who lived in Washington wanted to use the law. Now, Washington has a law, but this was his physician and he wanted to use his physician, but he couldn't do it because of the Oregon residency requirement. So he sued the state of Oregon or the doctor sued. I don't know who really brought the lawsuit and the state settled. And then the state legislature passed a law removing the residency requirement. 
After Oregon dropped its residency requirement, the state of Vermont also dropped its residency requirement. So the senator is feeling that maybe it's time for California to do this also. This brings up something else interesting. States watch what other states are doing. And one of our hopes is that if we can get a change to the law in California, we think there will be a domino effect. California has often been more progressive out ahead of other states in terms of passing legislation in, in certain areas. And we hope that we can be a leader here too. So um, that is included in this bill. And the other thing that's included is removing the sunset clause. A sunset clause is often part of a bill when it's first passed and it has a date. And what that means is that on the date that that sunset clause comes due, if the legislature doesn't reauthorize the bill or extend the sunset date, the bill no longer is in effect. Um, SB 380, the people that proposed it, that was Senator Eggman, hoped to eliminate the sunset clause. And that piece of the bill did not get passed. They did extend the sunset clause. So this current sunset clause is 2031. But again, we would like to, and by the way, a sunset clause is often added to a bill when it's legislation where the legislators want to see data, they want to see how the bill plays out. And it was a reasonable thing, I think, at the beginning. They wanted to see how is this going to work in California? Are there going to be problems? Do things need to be changed? But at this point, we've had the law in effect since 2016. And um, we think it's time to remove that sunset provision. So that's what's in the law. Judy, do we want to see if there are questions at this point? Yes. We have a couple of comments and a question. Linda from Ontario, not Ontario, California, Ontario, Canada, says that uh, she watched an excellent documentary about this subject last year, and she put a link to it in my own time, in my own time film.com is recommending that people who are interested in further understanding the subject watch that documentary. And Judy Fontana is asking about uh, the medical community. Are they generally in favor of this, opposed to it, or wh where do they stand? Well, it's a mixed bag. Of course, there are physicians that are uh, using the law, helping people use the law. Many physicians are reluctant. And so it's it, the opinion is really mixed, you know. So there's there's individual doctors, and then there are the big medical organizations. The senator's staff is in conversation with the California Medical Association, and they, it sounds like they may be open to to some of the um, pieces of this legislation. We'll see, you know. Strategically, it's important whether a, an organization actively opposes legislation or remains neutral. For instance, the, Alzheimer's, the California Alzheimer's Association is going to remain neutral. We consider it a win, actually, if a big organization is doesn't take a position on, you know, because we don't expect them to support us. Some organizations are supporting us and we're actively looking for others who that will sign on as organizations supporting us it's interesting because one of the it, there hasn't been polling data on what we're trying to do um, but what's interesting is that the polling data on um how people feel about the end of life option act is interesting because when when people just citizens are polled the approval rates very high about 75% i think in the medical community it was about 50% so public opinion 
is out ahead of the medical community. And it's, you know, as with many other things, it's out ahead of legislators. Um, nationwide, there's a very strong support for end of life laws. But, you know, uh, there are many, many states trying to pass laws, and they have laws in various stages uh, of the process. But there have been no new laws passed in any states in the past couple of years. So again, you know, the legislate legislators hold the power, even though their constituents are usually in favor of this legislation. Hmm. There is an there's an important uh, organization, by the way, that was started by a Berkeley doctor named Lonnie Shavelson. It's called Acamade, uh, American Academy, American Academy of, I don't, I forget exactly what that acronym is, it, it, but it's a Medical physician. aid and dying, maybe, is the main part. Um, what he's, he was an, an emergency room doctor for many years, and when the law was passed, he shifted his practice and his entire practice was helping people use the law. And he has a, a pretty wonderful model. He said that his model is you don't just write a pres prescription and say, you know, goodbye and good luck. You are with that person through the entire process. And he started this uh, organization to recruit doctors to work with the law and train them. And they also collect data, which is very valuable. Be and he's been instrumental in refining the cocktail of medications that, that are used. Um, one of the problems with the current way the, the medication has to be taken is that it can take many hours for a person to die. This isn't a problem for the dying person because within a few minutes, you know, there's a lot of sedatives in it. Within a few minutes, the person is comatose. But if it's many hours, that's really stressful for a family that's sitting by the bedside and waiting for the person to die. So Dr. Shavelson has been working with his people to do whatever they can to reduce the time from ingestion to death. And they have been able to reduce it, although in some difficult cases, it can take many hours. But that's you a good know yeah, do you know about how many people have taken advantage of this law since it was passed, and have there been any problems? We have not seen problems. You know, one of the arguments, uh, really the main argument that the disability community uses is what we would call the slippery slope argument, that that people will be coerced. It's the same argument that that's often used about, you know, old people. It, it, Grandpa will be encouraged to do this uh, so, so that his family doesn't have to take care of him. Well, first of all, just being old or just having a disability doesn't meet the requirement. So the other thing is that, of course, in the disability community, there is a history and a legitimate concern about people being vulnerable. And certainly there have been cases of people with disabilities abused and harmed by caregivers. This is a very different process. A person has to jump several hurdles to be approved to use medical aid in dying in California. A person has to be alone with clinicians making a request, ha has to be very clear that this is what they want to do and that nobody's influencing them to do it. Um, so there are are pretty ro robust guardrails, and we are leaving those all, all in place. People have looked to try to find cases of coercion, and you know the law in the US has been in effect since 1997. No one has ever been able to find any, and we're pretty confident that it hasn't happened. In terms of how many people use it, the state of California puts out statistics every year. I think in 21, the, um, in 2021 in California, 500 people, probably 500 people qualified. I know once people qualify and get the medications, there are people who don't end up using it. Um, some people feel 
great that they have it as an option and then decide they don't need to do it. Some people probably die before they do it. But interestingly, Canada, which of course has a much more progressive law than we do, which has about the same population as the state of California, during that same year, 10,000 people accessed the law in Canada. So if the law were expanded here, we don't know what the numbers would be, but we surely know they would be greater. The California Department of Public Health is estimating that by the year 2040, there will be over 2.1 million people with dementia in the state of California. So that's that's a tsunami headed our way. And I'm fairly certain that many of those people would choose to die peacefully while they're still competent rather than let the disease take them. We all know that dementia is, it's a one-way street with no exits and there are no treatments that really uh, stop its progression. Wilma is asking, what can she do? What can we do to support this bill? Oh, thank you. That's a wonderful question. Um, what you can do is go on to our website and you'll see a, uh, a tab that says, join our effort and slash sign up for our newsletter. That will do two things. That will put you on our list and we will be able to update you about what's happening. And for instance, right now, just yesterday, we sent out an email to our supporters saying, please write a letter supporting the bill. The number of support letters that come in is important because the legislators know this and they keep track of it. So it would be wonderful if people would would join up, if you would tell your friends about us. By the way, we can get support letters from out of the state and even from out of the country. I actually just emailed a friend in the UK who's active in a Right to Die organization to see if they will support us. Yeah, and I see that Wayne has put your web address website in the chat, a betterexit.org. So that's where people would go to uh, right. join our effort and get the updates and to be able mm -hmm. to support you. Robert has a question. Robert? Thank you very much for updating us on what's been going on, and thank you for your good work. I have a question. You said that in Switzerland they have the this process that's very quick and painless. Can you say what that is and yes. uh, is there some reason why they can't use this in California? Okay. The reason we can't use it in California is because of the word ingest. It's a language issue so that ingesting is, has been interpreted as taking in to the GI tract. Um, physicians will tell you that a medication that you can put into the vascular system is much more efficient. And that's what, what the Pegasus Clinic uses. What's interesting about it is that although my husband uh, turned a little dial, the, the IV was in his wrist, but Pegasus also has workarounds. So if someone is paralyzed, if, if someone can't use their hands, they have, I don't know what the workarounds are, but we also know that the, the technology now exists for commands to be done with people's eyes, people that are paralyzed, you know, so it, there, it easily could be done. What they use at Pegasus is a large dose of pentobarbital. Uh, which is a very, very effective. I, I think that's what vets use. And of course, uh, needless to say, we uh, provide more humane deaths to our pets than we do to for each other. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Mark has a question. Hi. So slippery slope uh, concerns the disability community, 500 enrollees in California in 21 compared to 10,000 in Canada. So do we see any Canada data that sh would give some examples of slippery slope concerns or other concerns being a bit ahead of us? You know, I, I the only thing I've heard about Canada is um, there's been some question about whether people who don't have adequate 
means to support themselves or using the law. Again, it's not so easy to qualify here for the law. The other thing is that, you know, the law, the uh, end of life law in Canada is part of their national health system. So it's, you know, it's a different landscape. Uh, Canada is also considering allowing assisted death for people with mental health problems. They're, they're having trouble figuring it out and they've put it off for another few years while they're studying it. I certainly have gotten questions from people. I'm the person that monitors the email that comes into a better exit. And there have been several people that have written saying, you know, they have tried every possible treatment and would this help them? Um, it's certainly true. And I know this from my, you know, my years as a psychologist, that there are people for whom treatments just don't work. There's some people with just intractable depressions that, that don't respond to anything. We are not proposing that mental health be, issues be part of the law at this point, because we think that the U.S. is not ready for that. We have to be practical. And it's going to be a, a stretch to, to get the reforms we're working with now. Um, the other question that often people often ask is, um, can I make a statement now and say that when I can't recognize my loved ones, I don't want to be alive? Well, that would be what's called an advanced directive. And many mm -hmm, people mm -hmm. feel that we should have that. I actually agree with that. But the big problem is that if we asked for an advanced directive, what we are then saying is we would have to be saying that euthanasia would be part of this law. And I think that there are countries, including Canada, by the way, that where euthanasia, in other words, the doctor, a medical person administering the lethal medications is allowed to do it. Um, we think that the U.S. is light years away from allowing that. We have enough trouble getting the medical professionals to uh, agree that people should ad administer to themselves. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, not to side with the disability community, but just to possibly, I don't know, validate their concern is is appropriate terminology but, or way of putting it, but maybe Canada even having on the table that down the road, the disabled could be a uh, part of the process would be an example of the slippery slope they consider could happen here. It may not be that steep of a slope, but uh, maybe that would be an example of what they would well, consider point to a slippery slope unless you know better what they would consider slippery right. slope. Well, this bill will specifically say that disability is not a qualification for the law. I mean, it's an, it's entirely possible that someone's disability is making their life unlivable. That's, you know, that's one thing, but, but simply the fact of a disability would not be a qualifying uh, criterion for someone. Yeah, yeah. Thank Wilma you for is that. Ask, oh, sorry. Wilma is asking, uh, do you know, or do the Canadians on the call know whether U.S. citizens can go to Canada for this end-of-life treatment? They cannot. Switzerland they cannot. is the only country that will provide an assisted death for non-citizens. You know, there are a number of countries that have assisted death um, besides Switzerland, uh, Luxembourg, Belgium, Holland, the Netherlands, Spain, Colombia, which is a Catholic country, which, and interesting, Spain is a Catholic country, uh, Canada. None of those have a six-month requirement. Australia has an end-of-life law, but they do require the six months. So, But in Canada, you have to be a resident and you have to be part of their national health system. So um, that would be conven that would be more convenient than Switzerland in terms of travel time, but Switzerland is the only place. Okay. I also see a comment here that in addition to the Canadian documentary, there was a documentary made in 2011 about Oregon, how to die in Oregon, that there's a link also in the chat. So two films for people to watch, plus go onto your website, sign up for the newsletters and, and support your efforts. 
I'm looking at any other questions, any other hands raised? Going once, going twice. No, but I just want to say thank you very much for the effort that you're taking and it's much needed. And as a retired nurse who worked in long-term care, I applaud you. And this thank is great. You. Thank you. You know, we, we do have a lot of supporters who, um, like you, have have seen people at the end of life, nurses, healthcare workers, physicians. What's interesting is that organizations are often um, very cautious about taking a position to support this kind of legislation, whereas often their members, members are quite enthused about it. One of the organizations that we have been in conversation with, and you probably are familiar with them, is Compassion and Choices. Unfortunately, in the past, they have actively opposed efforts to expand the law. And we are hoping that they will not actively oppose us, but we don't know for sure yet. It's too bad be if they do, because really, um, we all have the same ultimate goals, but they're very, very cautious about approving any expansion to the law. Yeah, I think I had heard that they were more interested in expanding it to more states. That's right. Than, than goal, to going further with the laws that are yeah, currently you're, in the you're absolutely right, Judy. Their goal is to get the present law, because as I said, every the 11 jurisdictions have basically the same law, to get that law passed in as many states as possible before they talk about expanding. We just, you know, we we applaud their efforts, they've done good work, but we don't think that's a realistic position because uh, among other things, we know that no red state will ever pass this legislation and uh, no state has passed it in the past two years. In the meantime, we've got people that really would like and would need to use this law, you know, uh, we don't know how many people end up taking their own life in other ways because they can't access the law, because they have a diagnosis they, they can't live with. And um, some of those situations, you know, certainly are upsetting and some of them end badly if people take pills and don't don't end up dying, you know, they they may end up stuck in a nursing home, they may end up in exactly the situation they were trying to avoid. So, um, or friends like mine, where their son took a gun to his head and in their bedroom. Yes, because, because of intractable pain. And that's not how he wanted to do it. But he had no choice. Yeah. And it, that's a tragedy when that happens. It's just a tragedy. Yeah. So yeah, one of the stories up on our website is of a woman in Berkeley who she happened to be disabled. She was in a wheelchair because of an accident, but the problem she had did not have to do with her disability. She had um, a very rare condition where she couldn't absorb food properly and she was nauseated all the time and simply couldn't take it anymore. And she drove herself in her wheelchair to... Uh, that right in front of the Berkeley police station with a note attached, you know, do not resuscitate and sh shot herself. Um, so we, we really need um, a law that, that helps more people. Ironically, uh, it's kind of a two tier system. I mean, I, I think it really can be thought of as an equity issue because um, if you are unlucky enough to have, a terminal cancer diagnosis, this law will probably help you, you know, in most cases it will. But if you have dementia or a progressive neurological condition uh, that eventually will end your life, the law will not help you. It looks like uh, Wilma's got her pen and paper out ready to write a support letter. She's asking, how soon do you need them? Oh, and I see we have a question from Linda, our resident Canadian. Linda, what hey. question do you have? Yeah, yeah. I just want to tell you this: this issue affects me because my dad jumped off a seven-story balcony. Oh my! Yeah, in Canada. He, yeah, because 
Well, it was, I tried to bring the issue up with them, right? Because he had progressive um, Parkinson's, you know, like the, and he was getting worse and worse. I said, mom, you have to give him permission to go if he wants to go. And my mom just cut me right off. And I said, mom, you have to get in contact with Maid and see what happens. And of course, they tried it at the last minute. And my dad's doctor refused, you know, the neuro, the neuro doctor refused. Mm -hmm. And my, and his own physician was on holiday at the time. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and so he took his own life by jumping off a seven story balcony. So this issue affects me. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. It's not. And, um, and, I see two other problems that I don't think are being talked enough about with this issue. The one problem is in your country, finances. It's like this, 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 like, like, um, like, because in some places, like you say, in the red States, um, people are not allowed to do it there. And they're forced to go to Switzerland. Well, that discriminates against the poor people. Absolutely. Okay. And the second issue, my like my dad belonged in the silent generation. That, you know, his like he came before the boomers. And I think the second position is if these laws are available. And these options are available even in Canada. And we're making great effort. My mom and dad didn't know about it in time. Mm -hmm. But it's not only about the knowledge. How do you break through the more conservative mindset of the silent generation? Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? It's like there's a lot of fear and ignorance around these options like with my parents you know it was their lack of information and their fear that that finally you know and their own stubbornness as mm -hmm. well as the fact that the information is not easily available for these people it's a good point linda even when it's legal there are other obstacles yes well, and, and Linda is raising a very important point, which is, um, and I'm well aware of it, that we were very fortunate that we could afford to go to Switzerland and to pay the clinic. It's about 10,000 euros, which sounds like a lot. Oh. Although we realized in retrospect, that probably was very fair because they put in a yes. lot of time. They do a lot of work. They deal with all of the paperwork with handling the body. You know, the, the uh, ashes are sent back to you. Um, but not everybody can afford to do that. And not everybody has the physical capacity to make a trip to a lot of people are frail or physically not strong, you know, for, for those of you that travel, you take a long trip across an ocean, it's tiring, oh. even if you're not sick, you know? So um, it, yeah. it, it's, it's really not, not something that everybody can do. Yeah. But I also noticed, and I think you're very wise in the States not to try and become Canada overnight. I think I really have to, give you kudos for being a very wise and profound woman. And I want to thank you for these efforts. Thank you. Thank you. And, and I do agree with you. The Overton window in the States is way farther to the right than it is in Canada overall. Yes. And if you try to push it too fast, it's going to backfire. Yes. Well, you know, one of the big differences, and, and in Canada, you've got a different government system, the Supreme Court of Canada ruled that it was unconstitutional to deprive people of this right. And the Supreme Court in the U.S. Se several years ago, before the, our court was as far to the right as it is now, ruled that we do not have a constitutional right to end our life. It's kind of a... Uh, yeah. 
a bolt taking decision. You know, I mean, we we seem to have so many people in this country that feel they have the right to tell other people what they can't do. Uh, but we don't have a constitutional right. So it does have to be state by state as what has happened yeah. with uh, the Dobbs decision and reproductive uh, rights. As far as the cost goes, uh, Marsha, generally Pardon? do insurance plans oh. cover this um, cost or Medicare or Medicaid? I, I believe that Medi-Cal covers the cost. I think the cost of the meds privately is probably, I've heard figures of like seven to $800 what I don't know, I know that Kaiser Permanente works with, you know, is very supportive of of the law. I don't, I, I need to find out. I don't know what the meds cost for a Kaiser patient. Probably would depend on what the, what plan yeah. they have. Yeah, but even in Canada, like Alberta, like the prairie provinces were much more resistant to allowing MAID mm -hmm. to happen because they are more conservative provinces. We kind of have our own version of red states, the, yes. but they're not as deep red. Like in Alberta, we had a premier, uh, like a governor in Alberta who was anti-vax. Mm -hmm. ah, Believe it or not. Crazy. Yeah. Crazy. How about, yeah, okay, it is. Karen's got a question. Thank you for uh, offering your insights today. I have two unrelated questions. One is, do you have you seen or do you anticipate uh, red states trying to criminalize supporting people crossing state lines to get, say, going to Oregon the way they are doing with abortion? Um, we haven't heard it yet. It certainly could happen. I think, though, my understanding is that we actually have a constitutional right to cross state lines. I mean, I, I think... Uh, I haven't followed it that closely with uh, people crossing state lines for abortion services. Um, the one thing that's kind of complicated about removing the residency requirement is that patients are advised, say, if they go to Oregon or Vermont from a state that doesn't allow MAID, that they stay in that state yeah, the, the medi medication be because if they go back, let's say they go back to Alabama, just to take a, an example, with the medication and anyone helps them in any way, that person could be liable for prosecution. By the way, one of the things my family considered, one of my kids had lived in Mexico for several years and she said, well, I have you know, friends in Mexico, I'll go to Mexico, I'll bring drugs in. And we said, thanks very much for the offer, but we're not risking you to going to prison. We have enough on our plate right now. But um, what I did research was, if you try to help someone in California, end their life, and you're discovered, that is a felony, and they are prosecuted. Now, how many people actually are you know, convicted. I don't know, but that was not something we wanted to take a chance with. Yeah, who was that? That Doctor Death from what twenty Kevorkian. years ago? Yeah, Kevorkian. Kevorkian. Whatever you. happened with him? Well, he went to prison. I mean, in in some ways, he's a hero in the movement because he really opened up the conversation. But he was providing euthanasia, which is different. And um, you know, there are many people in the U.S. who don't have a problem. I personally wouldn't have a problem with seeing euthanasia approved, but I know that we're very, very far from being able to have that happen in the U.S. Okay. All right. That looks like, oh, Wilma. One. Okay. Wilma has a question. Okay. I have a, I belong to the Unitarian congregation out here in Goleta and our board of trustees wants to know how they can support you. Is it better to have a letter from an organization or- Oh my goodness, it would be each of those wonderful things. if they would, if you would email me, um, send an email to contact or my email, which is marsha at a better exit.org. There is a form to submit. We would love to have, um, have them as an organization supporting us. By the way, we have an interesting organization supporting us that I never knew about. It's called the Clergy Project. I don't know. Oh, we know them. We know, you know the Clergy them? Project. Yes, yes, yes very well. Our clergy who are now atheists and they are one of our supporting organizations. So it's wonderful to have any 
any organization. So if any of you, um, thank you very much for that question. If any of you know any other organizations, I don't know, Judy, if the Humanist Society of Santa Barbara would be willing to be a supporting organization. I bet they would. I'll ask them. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there was a question earlier. Sorry about when when you need. Oh, hold on, Robert. I think Wilma's still talking. I was trying to write down your email, and I'm not very oh, good at doing it. Mar Marcia M A R C I A at a better exit dot org. I would also get it if you send it to that contact at a better exit. Okay. Sorry, there was a earlier question about uh, when you when is the best time to send these letters. Well, the best time is now. And the other thing we're going to be doing um, is uh, within probably early next week, we are going to send emails to our supporters who are constituents of the members of the Senate Health Committee to specifically contact those people, try to have meetings in the district office. Um, so, and there will be other times we'll, where we will be asking people to send support letters. So, but uh, now is really a good time because the letters are already coming in. Okay, Marion, you've got a question? Oh, you're on mute. I there just wanted to thank you so much for doing this. I sent out your email that I got. I don't know how I am on your list, but I sent out that to 654 people oh. in town. Oh and, my goodness. And, Thank you so much. And That's suggested wonderful. that they all write letters. And some of them I notice are here listening today. So wonderful. I'm wonderful. That's wonderful. And um, if you mention us to people, ask people to sign on on our website, because that means we can then contact them. So that, okay. that, yeah, thank you so much. Sure. Okay, Mark, your hand is raised. Yeah, just one more thing. It's a, um, a attempt at appreciation through potentially improper humor. But typically I'd give the opposite advice, but your work is very valuable. Definitely need you around. And God forbid you do end up with a terminal illness if you'd not practice what you preach. We very much appreciate that. Stick around a little longer. <laughs> <laughs> I in, I intend to, although it's entirely impossible that this effort will outlive me. <laughs> That'd be great. <laughs> thank you. Okay. Well, thank you, everyone. And thank you so much, Marsha, for coming and sharing. You can see you've got a lot of support here in the Santa Barbara area. And great through group. Our... I mean, and, you know. Appreciate it. it. I think humanists are uh, people that, that this kind of issue resonates with. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes, okay. this is Jean. This is Jean Fisher. Are you hearing me? Yes, we hear you, Jean. Oh, I can't figure out how you um you know, oh, how to I raise do. your hand. <laughs> yeah. Do you have a question? Here. Yes, um I do have I have um Alzheimer's and the situation. One I just want to make a comment of what I've been having for like three three years etc we need more um more freedom to speak comfortably of how we are feeling without being afraid that somebody's going to not understand I, i'm trying to say this but they're there it's there's a negative feeling out there about alzheimer's you mention you say it and people are afraid to talk about it they don't know what to say and that makes us even more um uncomfortable in fact when i did have my job when i found out i had aphasia um i got that one too <laughs> but when i found out I did not tell anybody at work for like half a year until I had a breakdown mm -hmm. because I was so afraid. We need to get more freedom for, for, for doctors too to have some kind of magazines out to 
say what this is all about so we can be free to talk that no we're not poison and and we need to have people feel more comfortable to talk to each other about it because that helps us feel more comfortable too thank that you for listening excellent. i'm sorry to, to squeeze that in at the last minute but thank you for listening thank you gene thank you gene yeah any comments on that marcia well yeah i mean i i think that um you know you 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 probably are all aware that the greatest risk factor for developing dementia is age that with each decade of age our risk goes up and we are living much longer than earlier generations because of the advances in, of medical science and because we had better nutrition as kids than our parents and grandparents so the numbers of us developing dementia are greater and greater and and uh I absolutely agree. There, there needs to be more understanding, more services, and hopefully uh, a change in the law so that people can make an informed choice. I mean, there are people who have said to me, well, you know, uh, my parent or my grandparent had dementia, but they were happy. They, you know, it didn't, they seemed to be placid. Unfortunately, with dementia, there's no way of uh, predicting what course it will take. Some people are quite placid. Others are quite um, upset. I had a conversation with one woman who said her mother had uh, advanced dementia. And in the last two or three years of her life, she was either screaming or crying all the time. And you can imagine what that had to be like for her as well as for her family. So, um, you know, it's, it's a little bit like the bumper sticker I saw in Berkeley a number of years ago. If you don't believe in abortion, don't have one. And obviously, if somebody doesn't think they want to have an assisted death, fine. But I think that many of us would like to have that option um, if we have a diagnosis or a condition that, that makes it uh, makes our life not worth continuing with. Yeah, thank you. Okay, uh, with that again, thanks again for uh, speaking with us and sharing with us. Very much appreciate this topic. And as you can see, our members are very much uh, on board with you supporting it. And um, so thank you.